So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And welcome to Martin Gambrell. Martin has worked at the World Bank for almost 30 years and for the last six years or so has been the lead water and sanitation specialist at the World Bank. He is now leaving the bank and will be a visiting professor at the universities of Newcastle and Leeds through the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering's visiting professor program. Martin has worked in the water and sanitation sector for over 35 years through a career encompassing research, working for consulting engineers and NGOs and the bank. Martin has a bachelor's degree and PhD in civil engineering, focused on the treatment of wastewater for safe affluent reuse and irrigation. At the World Bank, Martin has been engaged in a wide range of sectoral issues in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and Eastern Europe, including in the preparation and implementation of investment programs focusing on urban water supply and sanitation, utility reform, water pollution control, rural and small town water and sanitation, integrated urban water management, peri-urban wash, slum upgrading, and urban and city development. Unfortunately, Martin was not able to visit in person today, but we will be inviting him back shortly in person as soon as is physically possible. So please contact me if you'd like to meet in person during his visit. And here at AAVOG, we have an ongoing conversation about how to get our research into policy and practice. So I think we're all really looking forward to Martin's firsthand experience in this regard. So thank you, Martin, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Linda. I will start sharing my screen um, and we'll, do you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So thank you, Linda, for the introduction. Um, I'll get straight on with it because I want to get into the meat of things and, and hopefully we'll have time for discussion at the end as well. The, the title of the talk is Influencing Water and Sanitation in Development, Taking Research into Policy and Practice. Um, and I'm, my talk will cover um, a little bit of background on what the World Bank is, um, its work in the water sector, the World Bank's project cycle, which is important for us to understand in terms of how um, research can influence the project cycle, and then different examples of influencing policy and practice through global advocacy, specific project advocacy, and during um, the design and implementation of projects. And hopefully we'll have time for a discussion at the end. So I'm going to start by talking about the World Bank. I'm drawing on the World Bank's annual report 2021, which was just published. We've just had our annual. Sorry, I still say we. It's been a long time at the bank. So when I say we, um, I, it's they now, but you know what I mean. Um, it's just, we've just had our annual meetings and the, uh, the current annual report is crisis um, from crisis to green, resilient and inclusive recovery. And um, the bank has mounted a rapid and comprehensive response to help countries address the wide range of impacts of COVID-19, um, including um, uh, uh, um, some big investments and, and funding to 100 countries. The numbers are at the top there, but it's looking, we're looking to move towards a green, resilient and inclusive recovery from COVID, investing in climate smart solutions, identifying, reducing and managing risks, for climate change, pandemics and natural hazards and doing it in an inclusive way, um, investing in human capital. We also have a climate change action plan, which has a number of milestones and important um, act, act, actions and activities that need to be in, taken into account in our in, um, investment lending. The, the World Bank Group is, um, consists of five um, um, entities. Um, it's one of the world's largest sources of financing and knowledge for developing countries consisting of the five institutions mentioned here, and they share a commitment to reducing poverty, increasing shared prosperity, and promoting sustainable growth and development. The ones you have probably heard of are the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or the IBRD, which lends to governments of middle income and credit worthy low income countries. The International Development Association, or IDA, which provides um, concessional um, financing grants and credits to governments of the poorest countries and the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which provides loans, equity and advisory services to, to the private sector in developing countries. The other two I won't mention for now. And the World Bank Group's mission um, centers on two overarching goals, to end extreme poverty and to promote shared prosperity. So this is just a snapshot of the, of the numbers. Um, 
the World Bank Group uh, delivered record levels of financing at an unprecedented pace in fiscal year 2021, um, um, include, and also in conducted in-depth in analysis and research and partnered with governments, the private sector and other institutions to help developing countries address the wide ranging impacts of COVID and to working towards a green, resilient and inclusive recovery. Some of the numbers are there um, in total around $100 billion across the world. And you see some of the numbers from the regions there. So our regional engagements, um, the bank operates in 142 countries worldwide. It continues to expand its presence on the ground in what it refers to as its client countries, particularly those affected by fragility, conflict and violence, FCV countries, we call them. And by doing so, um, we're, we're much more decentralized um, with nearly 50% of bank staff um, based in, in the regions in countries. And we have seven regions which are showed there in, shown there in different countries. There's a lot of information on this graph, but I wanted to give you a picture of how much goes into water and sanitation versus all of the other investment lending um, that the bank does. Top right, you have Eastern and Southern Africa in red. Top, sorry, top left, top right, you have um, East Asia and the Pacific in green. Bottom right, South Asia in brown, and bottom left, Latin America and the Caribbean as four examples. And if you look at around 11 o'clock on those pie charts, you'll see water, sanitation, and waste management. Um, in, in, in the top left, it's at 3% of all of our engagement in that region. Bottom right, it's at 13% for South Asia. So you get a picture that, of course, water and sanitation is incredibly important to us in the sector, but we're actually you know, a fairly modest um, part of the overall investment of the bank globally. So I'm now gonna talk about the World Bank and its engagement in the water sector. Um, a lot of this is 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 very uh, is is is, is um, second nature to a number of you, but the but the way the way that we have organised our um, our sector strategy is to look at the the water crises that the planet is facing, where we have too much water in terms of flooding and the number of people and weather related disasters that are affected by that, or we have too little water with so many people living in water stressed basins or affected by drought directly, or the water is too polluted due to a lack of um, sanitation, among other things, and that um, climate change is accelerating this global um, water emergency. So the World Bank Group's vision is a water secure war world for all, um, in which we look at sustaining water resources, delivering ser water services, and we mean water and sanitation and irrigation services, and building resilience to climate change through the, the lens of water. And we do that in different ways. In some countries, we have what are called country water platforms in which we analyze the different dimensions of development that are affected by the water cycle, um, either in a good or a bad way at present. And we do a lot of this in partnership um, to deliver country solutions at scale. And it may be um, curious to a number of you to think all those big numbers I gave you in terms of investment why do we need partners with, with, with some of those shown on the right-hand side? Why do we need such partnerships? Why do we need um, technical assistance? Um, well, the fact is, is that those large investment programs I mentioned are government programs and the government, obviously together with the bank, defines how that's gonna be spent. And often governments want to spend a lot of that money on infrastructure. And what we're trying to do through our different partnership programs that are mentioned here on the right of the, of the, of the screen, um, is bring in technical assistance, research and cutting edge thinking to influence our investment program. So one of our most important um, technical assistance programs is the GWSP, the Global Water Security and Sanitation Partnership, which is the, um, which has taken over from the Water Supply and Sanitation Program, WSP, that you may have heard about. And what's interesting is that GWSP was redesigned, reconfigured, to better leverage our investment programming. There was, there was some, there were some criticisms that WSP did great work, but it didn't always leverage all of the, all of the good um, investment operations that were possible. So um, we also have the 2030 Water Resources Group that works with private sector, um, government um, entities and civil society on the water resources more broadly. So there are two big um, TA programs that complement our investment. And the long term solution is that we hope to have a water secure world for all in which water services are provided for people, water is provided for production in agriculture, industry, uh, etc. And there's sustainable water for the planet as well. 
And again, we do, I mentioned our global knowledge and, and how we, we bring that into our projects and how our projects can inform our, our, our knowledge as well in this, in this um, circular learning here. So on the right, you see how much we're investing in water. Uh, at present, it's a lot of money. Um, and in, in the water global practice, but also in other global practices in the bank where water and sanitation are, are such as in the environment and urban practices. But we have a lot of knowledge work we do as well. We do analytic, what we call analytical work, which is like research work. Um, we do convening and we do advocacy. And we hope uh, in an ideal world, our operational lending, we, we take the lessons into our knowledge and our knowledge informs our lending. So the third part of the presentation is to talk about the World Bank project cycle. It's quite important to understand the World Bank project cycle in terms of how academic research can influence it so this this shows the world bank's project cycle it is um it is th the major piece in it is the country partnership framework you see there at 12 o'clock at the top that is agreed between the world bank and the the government um in question and it's led normally by the ministry of finance and the ministry of planning with obviously sector ministers uh, ministries influencing uh, that and if for example it says in the country partnership framework which lasts for four to five years that we will not be working on water and sanitation then that stops us in a particular country working in that sector that isn't often the case and those of us in the sector will make the case for why water and sanitation for example need to be included in the cpf so that is what governs our engagement on a four to five year time scale and then we have this we have this um project cycle for an individual investment program. So it starts with identification, it goes through preparation, appraisal, and through to implementation. Now, for a typical project, it can take anywhere from 12 months, which is very fast, to three years to prepare a project. And we're talking of investment programs that are anywhere from $50 million to $500 million. To give you an idea, these are large investment programs. So they can take, as I say, one to three years to prepare, and on paper, they're five to six years in implementation, but they can be anywhere from five to 10 years to actually implement. So they're large. And a big part of that is the stage two, the preparation stage, where we have to do technical assessments, economic and financial assessments, institutional assessments. We have to look at financial management, procurement. We have to look at the social and environmental safeguards and other aspects, and that can take a lot of work. And your average bank team working with their government counterparts are very, are very, um, are very stressed. They have guns to their heads when they're delivering on all those parts of the preparation. And that's where academic research and other research from the bank um, can help them do that work, prepare the project more efficiently and think more innovatively. That's where we can influence. But of course, a lot the projects aren't always um, fully prepared when they go to the board. And a lot of the, the, the final design work happens at stage five at implementation. So we can also influence through academic research, through the bank's own research, we can influence the design of the project at that stage five as well. And then every project has to under, uh, um, undertake an implementation completion and results report at the end. And we have an independent evaluation group that also evaluates the projects. And we, again, hope that that feeds back into future designs. So. That's how the World Bank project cycle works and how we can, and I will now talk about how we can influence that through policy, um, uh, through research and um, uh, how that, how we can influence policy and practice. And I'm going to talk about this in three groups, advocacy at the global level on big ticket issues, as it were, advocacy more specifically at the a project level and as I mentioned just now and during design and implementation, we can also have research influence. So talking about uh, making the case globally, I'm gonna um, make reference to a number of different examples of how that can be done. And I will bring, on, uh, bring in some examples from EAVAG as well and how you've been collaborating with, with me, with us in, in, on some of these. So the first one I'm gonna make the case um, for um, um, interesting, important advocacy work globally that has influenced um, the sector generally, but World Bank um, uh, engagements as well specifically, are the famous SFDs, the fecal waste flow diagrams. And there was obviously research work done. Two papers are shown there on the bottom left um, on, the, on the SFD. And 
back in the 2014-15, these papers were published. As I'm sure you're aware, um, this is Su Susanna is now hosting the SFD and it has an SFD generator. I show that on the bottom right. There's an example of an, F of an SFD there. And the top right is, is, is a pad, a project appraisal document. And all the things I just said about the World Bank, when you prepare a project, they are summarized in the pad, the, pad, the project appraisal document. And that is an example of a pad um, from the Lusaka Sanitation Project from May 2015. And I, mention, I show that because it's the first World Bank pad to have an SFD in it. And that's quite, that was quite a landmark for us because it, it got us thinking about not only um, sewers and wastewater treatment, but um, on-site sanitation and FSM as well. And again, the, the pad um, had that in it, as I say. I will, I'll give a quick example of, of where we used the pad for, sorry, where we use an SFD for advocacy. I was um, involved in a project in Dar es Salaam that was a, um, a sanitation project, but it was only focusing on sewers and wastewater treatment. And it was proposing at the time of preparation to go from 10% coverage of sewers with two new basins going up to 30% coverage. And we took the SFD for Dar es Salaam to the minister together with some compelling photographs and arguments and said, look, even after this project, you're still only, you know, 70% of the population will be on on-site sanitation and will, will be reliant on FSM. And we used, as I say, the SFD to make the case to the minister. We had like a 15, 20 minute meeting with him in which we managed to persuade him to include a whole component on on-site and FSM for Dar es Salaam that wasn't there previously. So that's a sort of, this is an example of research and advocacy that can help influence um, um, the design of a project. Now, getting from the, the green light to include it to actually how do you design and implement on-site and FSM under a World Bank project is another question. And I'll come back to that later, but that's one example, as I say. Another example is making the case globally for the, the role of sanitation in um, with regard to planetary boundaries and with regard to um, coastal and um, marine and freshwater pollution. And we've been working with um, Professor Ben Halpen of UC Santa Barbara um, for the last year or so. He's been mapping and he's just published this paper in the bottom right on mapping global inputs and impacts from human sewage in coastal ecosystems. And he's looking at the, con he's done a, a sophisticated modeling globally and looking at the impact from um, um, wastewater treatment plants, from um, um, sewage um, discharge directly and from septic tank discharge into estuaries and into coastal areas. And we've been discussing with him, how could we take that um, global work and do some granular analysis in specific cities in the global south so that we can make the case to the government and to the bank why we need to be looking at a holistic approach to sanitation to, to, um, to combat, to um, reverse these issues that are happening with um, coastal pollution, but also freshwater pollution, such as in the Great Lakes, where we've also been looking at this issue as an example. So that's another example of making the case globally and then drilling it down to influence um, our investment programs. Another example is the sanitation gap in climate policy and financing. We had an event at Stockholm World Water Week this year in which we brought together the Stockholm Environment Agency, the um, Global Green Growth Institute, the University of Leeds and others to look at this issue of why is sanitation left out of the NDCs. Um, this is obviously very um, um, important at the moment with COP26 just having um, wrapped up, but how can we get um, more attention to mitigation and adaptation and the role of sanitation in these um, within the World Bank and beyond the World Bank. So that's another important where we're making the case globally for people to take the sanitation sector more, more seriously for this, for, uh, uh, with regard to these dimensions. Another example, you'll recognize some of um, your colleagues here and some of your work. I want to just talk about some in the bottom right, there are some partnerships we've been working on um, on different initiatives to make the case globally. The, uh, those, those publications that are, that are shown there in the bottom left, we have the Sanitation Workers Initiative that we've been working on with WaterAid, the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, and now, excuse me, um, SMV, the Dutch NGO, on bringing attention to sanitation workers globally. And then we're trying to drill that down again into the impacts for that 
on World Bank lending. We have other um, examples there. At the bottom, we have the container-based sanitation um, report that we launched a couple of years ago that we developed together with the, the, the CBS Alliance. And then you'll see some other things that you recognize, but one that I want to draw attention to is a, is a forthcoming um, report, Small Town Wastewater Treatment and Reuse, um, which was supposed to be launched on World to Toilet Day, which I believe is tomorrow, but we, we ran out of time to publish it. So it's gonna be launched sometime in December. And I mention that because we've been working with Christoph Luti and other partners over for a number of years now at Stockholm World Water Week on the issue of small town water and sanitation. And that allowed us to identify that there was an issue there on decision-making guides for wastewater treatment. So um, it's an example, again, of how a global discussion can help us um, uh, develop a, a, a guidance manual that can help inform uh, World Bank projects. And the, uh, as I say, the other two um, pieces shown here, you'll recognize, of course, Linda's great work globally on bringing attention to the importance of us understanding FSM. And then Mienke's and Linda's work on Boleza, uh, the measuring device, in which we've been having specific discussions with the two of them and their team on um, on this important issue where we have projects where the question's being asked, how do we know what the quantity and quality of fecal sludge is under the ground? So this was really timely for us. And we, we're partnering with Mienke and Linda to pilot some of that work in some of our projects around the world. So some other examples of where we're influencing, um, I'm now gonna talk about where we're influencing, influencing projects more directly. As I say, there's a gray area between the global stuff and the influencing, it, it, it varies, but I've tried to break it down in this way. We've been doing a lot of knowledge and learning events around the world on citywide inclusive sanitation as an example. And we, we show some of those images there in which we bring together World Bank um, projects that are either implementing or planning to implement urban sanitation, um, government counterparts and the World Bank teams to think differently, to bring in examples from around the world and how you can do things differently where um, good examples are. And I mentioned this as well, because in our initial um, events, we had Linda and her team lead um, deep dives into on-site sanitation and fecal sludge management, which has really influenced um, our, our project designs in those places. Um, we also had Linda and Yenke come to Washington and do some deep dives in our own World Bank Water Week as well. So we've also worked with Christoph and his team on the MOOCs, and we prepared some modules for his urban sanitation MOOCs. And I think, Christoph, it would be good for us to revisit that um, and see whether we can complement some of those. I know you've been working constantly on that. And that's been a great thing to collaborate on. And then you'll see as well um, the work that you've been doing at EVAG on CONCAD. We, um, we reviewed a number of, uh, we, have, we reviewed your curriculum some time ago on that. And we also have, have talked to Christoph about what would be interesting would be to take CONCAD and also apply it to government agencies and not just the private sector. And we talked about piloting that in Ethiopia, for example, to influence our engagements in the project there. Um, Again, we've been working um, on something called the Citywide Inclusive Sanitation Costing and Planning Tool, where we're trying to stop governments jumping into master planning activities that can take one to two years to implement and can cost a million dollars and often sit on the shelf. And we want to have more, um, we want to influence them upstream and the costing and planning tool gets them to think about the sanitation service chain generally and not only the capital costs, but the operation and running costs of different um, sewered or on-site um, solutions along the sanitation service chain. And again, we've been working with Christoph. He, he took the costing and planning tool with some of his team and he, he, he applied it in Nepal and gave us some very valuable feedback on that, which we've, we've taken into account on our current version of the costing and planning tool. We're also looking at the bottom of the screen we, um, every World Bank investment project now has to look at GHG emissions, and we have a GHG accounting tool for that. But there's a lack of understanding, um, full understanding on the sanitation service chain when, when doing GHG accounting for sanitation, urban sanitation projects. So we're now working on a module of the costing and planning tool, which will look at GHG accounting for both on-site sanitation and for sewage sanitation, and look at both direct and indirect um, emissions of, of GHGs from that. Um, again, I mentioned master planning and what we found is that the governments 
and consultants can get stuck into these long cycles of master planning that can take, as I say, one to two years. And um, what we're trying, what we've done um, with our emergency rapid assessments and, um, in both Ethiopia and Yemen is to have a more um, agile approach to identifying no regret investments in, in these cities um, while doing a more um, conventional master planning process, we can identify some, as I say, some no regret, low flat fr uh, hanging fruits in uh, looking at different dimensions um, in those cities. And that we've taken that learning from Ethiopia to Nigeria and Kenya and from uh, and in Yemen, we're now into a second round of, of that sort of analysis for urban sanitation and water supply. Another example is our countywide inclusive sanitation from Kenya in which they wanted with their recent decentralization, they wanted to think not just about urban or peri-urban, but the whole continuum uh, um, from rural through to urban and um, through small towns. So we had a, we piloted a two year planning process there, which has now turned into a guidance note for all uh, uh, and, and, um, of Kenya's counties. And a number of them are now undertaking countywide inclusive sanitation planning processes more accelerated and that is feeding into a new um, urban sanitation program in the country so there are other examples during design and implementation and i'm getting towards the end of my presentation now um, other examples of things that we're doing that we feel are are important for um, improving the design and the implementation of projects as i mentioned earlier um, standard generic terms of reference, um, guidance notes for our project concept notes and, and, and indicators that project teams can, can draw on as an example. And I mentioned earlier that we moved in and we've moved, we are now moving to much more on-site sanitation and FSM work under our projects. We've obviously been working in the bank um, for a number of years on, on sewers and wastewater treatment, which we sort of understand a lot better. But moving then into on-site and FSM is quite complicated. And you'll see on the top right that, that you'll see in the picture, we, we prepare generic terms of reference in, in English and French for the pre preparation of on-site and FSM projects and components. And we took a lot of time over that. It took us about two years with a lot of um, outside consultation and inside consultation because it's much more difficult to do this work and it's much more complex with the informality of service providers and how you go about doing this in a, it's more, it's more akin to solid waste management in a city as a number of you will know than, 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 than sewers are. So that's quite, that's an example of the sort of terms of reference to inform the preparation or the implementation of projects. We've, we've been working on design build operate contracts, for example, with um, DBO contracts for fecal sludge treatment plants in Ethiopia, for wastewater treatment plants in, in Tanzania. The mapping of low income communities is a very important thing we do during preparation or implementation to understand their realities. We've got um, connecting the unconnected. We just re we released a report last year on how you go about making sure if you do build sewer systems that people actually connect to them or you, you, you approach it through the condominial sewer approach from Brazil, which gets to very high levels of, of adherence and connection if you go about it in a participatory way. Um, wastewater treatment and fecal sludge treatment design. I mentioned the engineering design manual that we worked on um, for fecal sludge treatment earlier and the one we're going to be launching for wastewater treatment plants in small towns. And this issue of private sector participation, contractual models um, and sanitation markets is also an important area that we need to understand better. So I think this is my last slide on, on, on uh, um, some of the areas that we're looking at in ongoing and future research, which might be of interest to EAVAG, um, to your academic research. We're doing some work now, um, some interesting work on economic analysis for citywide inclusive sanitation and cost benefit analysis for these interventions to ensure that all of the different dimensions of urban sanitation are captured when we're comparing like with like. If you're comparing container-based sanitation with sewers, are you really taking, are you really providing the same services to, to the household? And, 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 and our economic CBA um, good practice analysis will take those dimensions into account. Um, we're doing some work with WaterAid and the University of Leeds on what we call sustainable sewage sanitation services. Sorry for the um, mouthful. We're also looking at combined versus separate sewers. Some important things there uh, in terms of, you know, um, our sewers, um, 
are they result are they resulting from the reasons I, I mentioned earlier with the coastal and the marine um, um, pollution? Are they resulting in the in the services we want? And combine obviously combined sewers where you have wastewater and and stormwater together can be a big problem in in industrialized countries as well. And is being is being discussed. So we want to um, have some think pieces on that as well. Behavior change is so important, as I think a number of us appreciate. And in urban sanitation, it's, in, it's, it's incredibly important. So we're working with behavior change specialists within the bank and outside of the bank on implications for urban sanitation. As I mentioned, um, FCV countries are very important to the bank. So we're looking at, we've been working in Yemen, in DRC and elsewhere, and we're looking at doing some think pieces on the implications for citywide inclusive sanitation in FCV settings. We've been working on wastewater based epidemiology and we've started to discuss the issue of fecal sludge based epidemiology as well, which is very important for things such as COVID, for example, and obviously other um, diseases. Um, the issue of policies, institutions and regulation or PIR, as we call it, is very important for sustainable service delivery, as are, of course, funding and financing and subsidies. So we're looking, we're doing some deep dives into that, into those works. We're working with um, Worcester Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor on some of that work, for example. We want to see, obviously, urban sanitation um, for a number of us is the hardest nut to crack in, in urban low income communities and slums. Water supply ought to be a lot easier to do. But so we're looking to bring in our urban sanitation thinking into washing slums. And we've been pioneering some of that thinking in, in South Africa, for example. Um, another thing I mentioned right at the beginning about the importance of a, a green recovery, another part of that green recovery from COVID is job creation. So we've been looking at the sanitation service chain and the different elements where citywide inclusive sanitation can influence job creation in the short and the, and the long term. And again, how urban sanitation, I talked about the, the World Bank water um, water secure um, water security for all and um, we've got a new initiative about water secure cities and how does urban sanitation complement that water secure cities in a cir circular economy thinking i mentioned these already i won't repeat them um, the ones i just mentioned one i did and oh, i mentioned sanitation workers initiative as well so there are a lot of there are a number of the ongoing and future research areas we're engaged in there are others um, and i hope that this sort of um, provides you with a with a um, a flavour of not only how you can inf you know specific areas where you could engage with the World Bank and other regional development banks on some of these um, topics, but also at what point in the in the World Bank's um, project cycle that you could you could do this work from the global advocacy down to the specific project. So I very much was hoping to be in the room with you today somewhere in 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 Zurich but um as we mentioned at the beginning maybe that could happen at some other point um in the new year but um Linda and co we now um regular we now have a um um an opportunity to discuss so I thank you and I will stop sharing my screen <laughs>